I'm very glad to have our next presenter here. Uh, his name is Darcio Xavier da Silveira. He is a very uh, renowned medical uh, professional in Brazil. He has been on the front line of public debates, uh, have been attacked by the anti-drug medical doctors mafia uh, <laughs> associations. He has fr he frequently goes to uh, public talks, uh, interviews with the media, TV shows. He's the guy everybody talks when they want to have some sort of more progressive view. There's not a lot of folks like him there, so we are very appreciative of his work. I'm also personally very thankful because he's also a teacher to me. I have been a student in his course when I was much younger and I guess uh, much less mature. And uh, I don't know what sort of impression that made, but <laughs> I, I think that not so bad because he's here today. So uh, I'm very happy. We this, this conference allows us lots of this ritual inversions where we have all these big masters to us. There, you can, as you know, uh, eat with your bibliography, you can <laughs> have a coffee with your references. So it's a really great uh, opportunity of exchange. And I think that has a high, high value for all of us. So uh, I'm not going to give more details on his formal uh, training. He can tell you about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bia. Thank you very much, everyone, being here. Um, I was invited to the MAPS. This is the first time I came to MAPS. Um, and as I was invited the first time, I said I couldn't come. Uh, and in the last minute, Bia really insisted a lot, uh, many times. And to the last moment, I accepted this invitation. So I'm here thanks to Bia's insistence. <laughs> Uh, at first, I told Bia that I, uh, although I have three projects, research pro projects on ayahuasca ongoing, I don't have e I don't have the results yet. But uh, talking to Bia, I was talking about some things I'm I've been thinking about uh, the adolescent study we have made about uh, some years ago. Uh, and Bia thought that it could be a good idea to to share these ideas, these this reflections, uh, particularly the methodological reflections about research on ayahuasca. Uh, in the in this meantime, in the last weeks, there has been some rumors, <laughs> some what do we call in Brazil small talk. <laughs> Uh, that I was coming here to deny the results of the adolescent studies, what we have done some years ago. That's not the case at all. Uh, we have conducted the study. Uh, it was very, a very careful study, a research group, very serious, very cautious. Uh, all details were quite good planned. This the study resulted in four papers published in the Journal of Psychoactive Drugs here in California. And I do, I do, uh, I do say that I am not changing any of my opinions about what has been published. I'm just uh, thinking about what should be done in the future in terms of research. And this study gave me some ideas, some, some questionings. And that's why I'm here presenting it to you. Oh. Well, uh, this project was conducted. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows me. I am a physician. I am a psychiatrist. I've been working with uh, drug addiction for the last 25 years in Brazil, Sao Paulo, in the School of Medicine of the Federal University in Sao Paulo. And uh, we have this, uh, this research in collaboration with the University of California. Uh, many, many research took part in this research. Uh, Charles Grobe, who is here, uh, me, Enrique Lopez, neuropsychologist, 
Evelyn Döring, who is here and our neuropsychologist too. Kyle Boone, Louise Alonso, and Marlene De, De Rios, who, who died recently, unfortunately. <coughs> Uh, well, I'm not talking about what ayahuasca is <laughs> in the end of the presentation. I'll jump this part. Uh, I just would like to mention that in the 90s, there has been the first important studies on pharmacokinetics, neuroendocrinology, psychiatry, and general health assessment among ay ayahuasca users. Uh, it was called the OASCA project conducted by Charles Grob and and collaborators. Uh, Callaway participated some publications, Makina too, uh, related to this this first assessment. Uh, <coughs> the rationale for what has been done it is said about substance use in general that substance use or particularly misuse is often associated with psychiatric symptoms. Uh, and also that substance use or misuse is often associated with the use of multiple dr drugs. So the question is, uh, could in some way ayahuasca be related to these problems too? That was the first question. Psychiatric symptoms and the use of multiple drugs. Uh, and also uh, that substance misuse is often associated with cognitive impairment. Uh, and we know that substance dependence frequently present impaired uh, neuropsychological performance. And on the other hand, subjects presenting a neuropsychological disorder are prone, are more prone to abuse drugs. The case of ADD, for instance. Uh, these are some rationale to, to support what we are questioning in the study. Uh, we know that neuropsychological impairment is often observed in the person under the effect of hallucinogens, during the effect, the acute effects. Nevertheless, long-term neuropsychological impairment is not easily detected among users. And furthermore, precise information about pattern of use, frequency, and amount of substance used are often not available. So much, m many of the studies are not very clear concerning this information. So the objective of this study we have done, conducted, is to, ass ac uh, to assess the effects of long-term long use of ayahuasca in terms of three areas, psychiatric symptoms, pattern of drug use, and cognitive functioning. I'm not presenting all the information of the results since, the, as I mentioned, they, has already, they have already been published in Journal of Psychoactive Drugs. But I'll get only some central information so that we ca can discuss um, these methodological questions, points. The sample, two groups of 40 adolescents, aged between 15 and 19, both sexes, uh, almost half and half males and females, were considered. Being that 40 adolescents from the Brazilian Syncretic Church, UDV, who had drank ayahuasca within the ritual context at least 24 times during the last years. Uh, and 40 adolescents matched by sex and age who never used Alaska, so that we have this comparison group. Uh, what have we assessed in terms of psychiatric assessment? We use some standardized instruments, the self-report questionnaire, the 20 question questionnaire, if you answer positively to s at least seven questions, you are probably a mental case. Uh, <laughs> not necessarily, but <laughs> it is said that uh, the CSD, Center of Epidemiological Studies Depression Scale, uh, the Back Anxiety Inventory, another, uh, the st STAY, the State Trait Anxiety Inventory. We also use the Body Shape Questionnaire, uh, Body Shape Questionnaire for those who are not acquainted with this. Uh, it's a questionnaire that assesses the self-image someone has towards its own physical, own, own body. 
uh, it's often uh, impaired among anorectic patients, bulimic patients, and we have studied some other conditions. We it, it, it's much more common uh, in the whole population than we initially expected. And uh, wait. Okay, about. And finally, the corners adolescence rating scales that uh, would, would de de detect attentional deficit and impulsiveness. So these were the domains in terms of psychiatric assessment. In terms of the neuropsychological assessment, we used uh, a battery of nine tests. The UCLA Auditorial Verbal Learning Tests, as the name says, is a learning test. Uh, the Ray uh, Figure Copy, it's, uh, we, you, it, it, it is a memory test. We have to copy a figure uh, after some, you, you see the figure, after, after that you have to copy to redraw re the figure. And it's a memory test, but that involves many complex cognitive functions. Uh, the trails, when you you have the the numbers and letters in sequence, uh, the layer tray of the same ray scales, digit span and digit symbol coding from the vexler scales for intelligence, the strip test. Uh, <coughs> that measures uh, working memory, frontal lobe activity. Mm, we got back to the auditory of our learning test, delayed trial, the same. And finally, the CPT, the continuous performance test that access uh, uh, attentional problems and also an impulsiveness. And we also assessed patterns of substance use in general. Both groups were of adolescents were assessed in terms of psychoactive drugs used through the following instruments, the drug use screening inventory, and uh, an instrument that gives us the pattern of substance use according to World Health Organization criteria. Well, the results. Uh, we have the two samples, UDV, the ayahuasca users, and the control group of uh, adolescents. Uh, half and half because they were, were paired in the same number of males and females. Age was quite similar. They were teenagers. Uh, race similar, most of them Caucasian. Uh, due to age, uh, most of them were single. Uh, social class, we have some difference here because it was not uh, matched by social class, the UDV, Ayahuasca users, uh, almost most of them were A class or B class, but uh, in the UDV group there was also some members of C and D class, less favorized people. Well, in terms of the results, the psychiatric assessment, general, general mental health, um, depression, anxiety, dysmorphy, the, the, the self-perception of the body, uh, um, no difference at all between the, the two groups. Uh, attentional deficit, we found some difference controls were more prone to have attentional deficits, deficits than ayahuasca uh, users, but this is not reach the uh, statistical significance. Uh, well, uh, the the previous uh, I uh, the, the previous one was for uh, male adolescents. Uh, the only uh, the, the, the we only identified this trend. The next one. As for female uh, assessment, psychiatry assessment. Uh, we also didn't find any difference in terms of s general mental health, depression, anxiety, and uh, we cannot see here, but attentional deficit. But among females, we have this difference in terms of uh, dysmorphic disorder. Uh, among the control group, 55% uh, had some kind of self uh, impaired self-perception of their bodies. What we couldn't find uh, among the uh, ayahuasca users, girls. 
In terms of uh, recent substance use, there were some minor differences. Uh, statistical significance was reached in terms of alcohol, where among uh, UDV users, uh, one third used alcohol in the previous 30 days. This is better. Uh, uh, while among the control group, two thirds uh, uh, of the adolescents has some kind of uh, recent alcohol use. Uh, in terms of amphetamines, there is a trend not reaching uh, statistical significance. And although uh, the use of other drugs among the control group was higher than the among adolescents, from the ayahuasca group, uh, this this difference did not reach uh, statistical significance. Next, uh, if we stratify the same data about recent drug use by sex, we can see some specific difference. Uh, this difference of male consumption uh, was particularly important among among men uh, in terms of alcohol recent use. Uh, among cannabis recent use, there was a trend among men, uh, uh, male adolescents to, of the control group to use more. Uh, and in terms of uh, amphetamines, uh, the girls of the control group there were more prone to uh, use amphetamines. Uh, the neuropsychological assessment. Uh, I many we have uh, as I showed you we have used many a b battery of many uh, tasks that uh, uh, assess the many uh, functions neurocognitive functions but we got the ones that had some kind of differences among the group. Uh, we have here comparing the ayahuasca group with the control group. We have a, a trend in terms of the Stroop test. Stroop test uh, is uh, is measuring uh, basically working memory, frontal lobe uh, functions, and we saw that here the control group has a, a, a better performance than uh, the ayahuasca group, although this was not s statistically significant. Uh, the ray figure which is a complex task involving many cognitive domains. Uh, we, uh, we have the, the ayahuasca group uh, uh, was poor, uh, poorer than the control group because this is time. So they had, they had uh, to, they spend more time in solving the problems than uh, the control group. And this reaches uh, statistical significance. Uh, <coughs> but we can say, this is, I will comment just, uh, it's, it's one of the points of the methodological questioning of this, this kind of work. At this very time, uh, in Brazil, we were discussing the problem of uh, uh, legalization or authorization of the official use of ayahuasca uh, in the religious contest. There was an intense debate at the, the, the time. And uh, UDV members were, were very, very worried that the results of the discussion could, could eventually result in some kind of prohibition or restriction in the U.S. use. And these ado uh, adolescents were uh, aware of this problem. And uh, one possible explanation for this higher time in in performing could be the excess of care <laughs> the, 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 they were spending more times in in doing a very good test so that they could prove that they were not impaired <laughs> and to have a good result this could be a confounding variable in this kind of study uh, another test that we used is the of the world uh, health organization uh, together with uh, uh, University of California, auditory verbal learning test is a learning test uh, in assessing basically memory, but as, uh, as well as other important cognitive measures. So it was we uh, what we we call a robust task. Huh? 
uh, you have to remember a list of words um, that are, can be divided in some cat categories, different categories, and you have to recall in many subse subsequent attempts. Uh, and the number of words you remember are coded, and there are some populational patterns, and we compared the two groups. And in this test, also, the control group performed better than the ayahuasca group. Uh, this test cannot be uh, altered by this kind of problem that uh, I mentioned in the previous test, because it's very rapid. The person has no time to choose or to decide what to do. Uh, it has to repeat just um, the, the the words he, he has uh, stored and in, is now recalling. And we saw that uh, there were um, uh, some minor differences among the group. Uh, but in the attempts, the, the, the last attempt, the attempt seven, they were weak, equal. Uh, uh, such a minor difference, not statistically significant, showing that this difference is not uh, noticeable. Uh, no. But here there is some some data that, w for our point of view, uh, may raise new questions and that may uh, uh, that should be uh, addressed in future research. When we separated, when we shared, uh, we split the group in, in according to social class. This is the control part, not. Uh, uh, Adolescents not using ayahuasca. Uh, if you uh, if you see the, the the performance of adolescents of the control group from uh, class uh, class A compared to class B, uh, you you can see that the the social economic status is a very important issue in terms of. Uh, um, Cognitive uh, uh, performance, but in the control group, it's what it was quite similar because we cannot see any statistical difference. So apparently, social class did not differentiate, did, did not uh, was not different when we compared uh, control adolescents, but yeah. But if we examine what happened in terms of social class between the adolescents that uh, adolescents that used ayahuasca, uh, we can see that we can reach some statistical significance in terms of the refugee delayed recall test and the attention verbal learning test. So people from less <laughs> less uh, less. Um, not uh, so highly educated, <laughs> uh, we could call this, it would be a, a better definition in terms of cognitive uh, performance. Uh, they do not perform as well as, as though that, have, that, that has had uh, more uh, opportunities in terms of educational background, is the class, uh, class A uh, subjects. Uh, so that's uh, uh, something to be addressed in future research. Uh, there is something that didn't happen in the control group, but does happen in the ayahuasca group, uh, is the influence of, uh, of this uh, social economic factors when ayahuasca is involved. So some comments um, in terms of psychiatric status, comparatively to controls, we have lower frequencies of positive scoring for body dysmorphism and attentional problems were detected among ayahuasca using adolescents. Uh, however, these frequencies of attentional problems and body dysmorphic symptoms in the control group were much higher than those observed in the general population. That's to say, although there was a different favoring ay ayahuasca users, uh, it was so uh, enormous the proportion of, uh, of these conditions among the control group that I, we can argue if they are really representative of the general population. Próximo? Yes. This is our main questioning. Can the sample of adolescents in the case of controls be considerably considered really representative? Próximo. 
in terms of pattern of substance use, ayahuasca adolescents tend to use drugs less frequently than the comparison group. Difference reached statistical significance for the use of alcohol. Uh, but we can argue, uh, we can ask, we can reflect. The observed difference in terms of alcohol use among groups could just be reflecting, could not but just be the reflect of impositive restriction of alcohol use with religious dogmatic principles. Because uh, we know that since someone in, in is in the religion, in UDV, uh, they are told to avoid alcohol use, so th that could be uh, a secondary effect due to this dogmatic principle uh, associated with the religi religion itself. Um, in terms of neuropsychological aspects, um, the lessons who consume ayahuasca did not perform as well as the control group, whatever extra cognitive strength was required. This extra cognitive uh, strength, uh, I mean the most robust neurocognitive tasks that demand many, many uh, functions, cerebral functions at the same time. Therefore, is, this, is it possible that ayahuasca may have some subtle effect on the co and con cognition that can only be observed before highly demanding tasks? Uh, and more significant differences were found between groups when social class were considered. Among higher class adolescents, no significant differences were detected between subjects and controls. Uh, where, uh, whereas among lower social class uh, adolescents, ayahuasca consuming adolescents tend to perform worse than controls on three domains, processing speed task, delayed visual memory measure, and verbal learning task. So, uh, finally, suggest uh, th that ayahuasca might, might have the subtle effect on different uh, aspects of the connection, only detectable under less privileged conditions. Less so, less educated people might be more sus susceptible to these effects. However, it is difficult to state whether this phenomenon might be due to a deleterious effect of ayahuasca on cognition or a mere reflection of poor educational opportunities due to unfair social economic conditions, or eventually both. We don't know. Next. Final comments. Uh, uh, ad uh, ayahuasca adolescents uh, use drugs less frequently than adolescents who do not use ayahuasca. Next. Uh, adoles uh, adolescents who did use, do, do, who did not use ayahuasca, presented more psychiatric symptoms than no non-ayahuasca users. And finally. Adolescents who consume ayahuasca performed well on all the neuropsychological tests. Why I'm after uh, showing those difference favoring control groups, I have this final comment. Because we must remember that although there were statistically different, uh, the statistically, uh, statistically sig significant difference among the groups in terms of cognitive performance, uh, th uh, the uh, ayahuasca group was, uh, they were all in the range of normality. So we are not saying that there was a normal impairment. They just went, were uh, less, less, uh, uh, th their uh, cognitive abilities were less sharp than the control group, but they, uh, but although uh, they were all in the normal range of cognitive performance uh, established in the literature, so uh, that's why I have this final comments in this uh, concerning the 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 uh, their neuropsychological status. Well, th these are uh, a resume uh, uh, in short terms what we have done, what we are thinking about these results. 
and we are open to suggestions so that we can have more ideas for our future research in this field. Thank you, Darciu, very much. So, uh, as announced before, the idea is that the two co-authors that are also present in the study uh, could be offered a chance to, to give their feedback. Uh, I don't know if Evelyn wants to, to make any comments. Okay. I'm Evelyn Döring, Xavier da Silveira, and I was uh, this, uh, neuropsychologist who investigated the, the, the adolescents in the study. Um, it was a very nice opportunity to, inv to go through this investigation and uh, mainly because, you know, the opportunity we created to investigate was especially nice. You know, we had these uh, teenagers, you know, all gathered controls and the ayahuasca uh, teenagers, let's say so, you know, in a hotel for three days and uh, we kind of um, uh, monitored all conditions we could, you know, especially drug use, someone who might perhaps, you know, have taken something from home, you know, to use, or even uh, cigarettes and alcohol and everything. So we were very careful and uh, we trust these results very much. What happened um, is, you know, that by, just by chance, we intended uh, when um, composing the samples, we intended to have the same uh, the same groups exactly. So this difference in in uh, uh, let's say in uh, socioeconomic status was just a, by chance. It happened by chance, and it gave us uh, uh, after um, analyzing the results. You know, it really brought us this uh, these doubts. Because uh, we know, um, I don't know if, if, if it happens in other cultures, but in Brazil, uh, education is uh, a problem. Either you are very good, you know, if you go to private uh, schools and you have opportunities, you are really fantastic, you know, in terms of cognitive um, uh, performance. And if you do not have the chance to attend these schools, you might not have the opportunity. You might be very smart, but you know these uh, tests, at least the way um, the methodology we used, these tests require people who are very much you know, uh, used to uh, using these uh, cognitive functions. So uh, uh, I think you know, our study, if we had the chance, should go uh, and uh, go deeper into studying people with uh, le you know, lesser opportunities. And uh, of course, the, um, probably we'd have to come up with different um, uh, instruments to analyze. We, in neuropsychology, we, we have what we call, you know, the, the um, uh, what's the name? The, um, I forgot the name now. No, 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 not a cue. Uh, ecological, Eco uh, uh, you know, the ecological, uh, neuropsychological tests, which are uh, tests made of, uh, uh, which analyze your cognitive function by asking you to perform uh, any task that involves your life, you know, so according to uh, the style of life you, you lead. So let's suppose, you know, we, we decided to investigate illiterate people we'd have to come up with tests which didn't require people to read or, you know, so, and then we would have a comparison. So, um, this is important. For example, ayahuasca is used, very much used in Brazil, and we have this problem. Um, it'd be nice to know, right? So, uh, if uh, there is any, any difference, because, uh, all drugs uh, teenagers use, we know, although they don't show exactly uh, many times in these formal neuropsychological tests, they do have a very subtle effect which we cannot uh, presume. But when age comes, and this will be added, right, to your life, you know, and in terms of uh, 
getting better or getting worse or perhaps um, not being able to to develop uh, you know your better side in terms of con cognitive function so you know all in all this was a v tremendous you know opportunity to study uh, these people but we wish we you know uh, perhaps we have the chance to go on and and uh, now that we know more about this um, see what uh, uh, how ayahuasca works in uh, adults and um, you know in different uh, groups of people and especially uh, uh, the uh, social economic status you know being a, an issue to be studied and controlled very carefully thank you thank you i uh, i want to to thank and um just make one remark and one question before I pass on to Charlie. Uh, the remark I want to make is that both Darchu and Evelyn came from Brazil on their own expenses. Uh, so they are spending a couple of thousands of dollars to be here now. I want a, an applause for that. Yeah. Uh, my question is to you before we, we hand in to Charlie is that I saw there was something in your abstract that I didn't see in the presentation that you mentioned in the abstract that you thought that perhaps the UDV uh, members had kind of played an influence on which uh, subjects would be picked uh, to participate and I was under the influence that the impression had suggested that perhaps in choosing the sample, there was some kind of bias because they they kind of excluded problematic subjects, so that would really compromise the rep representativity. Uh, but uh, you didn't address that. Is it something you wish to address? Yeah. Yes, I can. Uh, it uh, there there are two problems related to this question. Um, when I meant uh, representativity of the sample, it was quite by by chance it was randomized there is no uh, way to alter the the original um, constitu constitution of the two samples but when i see the results that there is an enormous amount in control group of people with uh, dysmorphic disorder among girls, of attentional problems among boys that are much higher than the general population, I, I consider this is not a representative um, sample of the general population. This is by chance. It's not something that has been done wrong. <laughs> That's not the problem. It's something can can happen in any study. Uh, another fact that I mentioned to you off the record, <laughs> because this has not been published, it, it's something that we had in the second step study we, we have done, uh, Charles Grob and me, it was interviewing some, uh, some uh, adolescents. Um, we have nef never published this, <laughs> this data. And since the, this was a very particular moment um, in the UDV, because there were the, the, the problem of the, the eventual restriction of ayahuasca use in Brazil, and that we saw many, many of the, the families very worried about what uh, Charles Grob and me we were doing in terms of reporting problems. And we, we have eventually uh, had to, to, to deal with situations where there was someone in the family with a mental health problem and the family was worried that could we could eventually attribute this, con this mental condition to the use of ayahuasca. So uh, this is a kind of uh, sampling manipulation that uh, we can understand from the, the point of view of what was happening in terms of ayahuasca um, law in Brazil. I don't know if I answer your question. Perhaps can you just explain how was the process of picking the 40 adolescents? How did that happen? What was the criteria? In this case of the qualitative part of the, the research, um, 
Uh, this was much more. This was not by uh, by by ballot or uh, randomly selected. We we just uh, uh, went to these uh, adolescents and they were referred. Uh, there was someone else. It was not. Uh, we we were not worried uh, in terms of uh, representativeness. So it was uh, more qualitative um, research. We were not um, worried about this kind of uh, representativeness. So we asked to to people to send us uh, adolescents using ayahuasca. Uh, it was not important of if they were mental cases somehow or not. Uh, this was not the, the, the major issue. Um, it was not important the the, the, the sampling random uh, the, the random le randomly selected sample. It was not the, the major issue. Perhaps Charlie can add something. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dartu. Excellent presentation. It's good to see our old data. It's been a long time, a long time since we've been together and with Evelyn as well. So it's really nice to see our, our, our work um, uh, discussed here. Um, in terms of uh, selection, I, 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 my recollection, there, there, there was no effort to, um, to necessarily screen out uh, 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 anyone. You know, this is uh, this was the second study with the UDV I, I was involved with. The first one in the early 90s with adults. Um, the screening there was uh, in a uh, temple in Manaus. A call went out for volunteers for the study, uh, and the criteria was simply you had to be a member of the UDV for at least 10 years. Uh, 60 people volunteered. Uh, there, there was. Um, a uh, room for, uh, we, we were recruiting for 15 subjects, so as was explained to me, they simply alphabetized the list and took every fourth person on the list and they were included in the study. The study with the adolescents called for significantly more subjects. So I think there the call simply went out for, for volunteer adolescents. Um, we, we should keep in mind that you know, this is a preliminary study. Uh, I think we have some very interesting information, but our hope was, and still is, that it would just be the first step in what will be a series of studies to examine the uh, cognitive function and mental health of uh, adolescents who are exposed to ayahuasca. This is a very important issue uh, w within the UDV at the time of the study, and, and the impetus for doing the study was that the Brazilian judiciary had questioned whether a sanction for use of, I of ayahuasca within religious context in the late 80s, whether it should be restricted for adults only. And the UDV felt very strongly that this was of great value for their, um, for the young people, so th they felt, uh, you know, a, an objective study bringing in outsiders, uh, neither Dartu nor myself are members of the UDV, that this would help kind of uh, uh, clarify this, uh, the, 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 this problem. Um, you know, I will say that the that it, within the UDV, um, it's very interesting how children are are um, get involved. Uh, women often uh, take uh, uh, ayahuasca in utero, but th th uh, while the children are in utero, uh, it, throughout pregnancy and it labor and delivery, it's somewhat different than the more indigenous model that was presented earlier. This, this morning, uh, babies are uh, baptized at ceremonies using an eyedropper, a couple of drops of ayahuasca. And then the general um, uh, trend is that uh, children do not participate until they reach puberty, and then they have a, the option. It's their choice. They have an option of joining their, their parents in, um, at, uh, at, at special UDV ceremonies that are more family-oriented. Uh, the UDV does express at least their belief that uh, the periodic use of ayahuasca actually improves cognition. That's their sense. In the adult study, we actually found some trends to back that, that the UDV members scored somewhat better on neuropsychological testing, although there it was not an ideal um, sample population because while UDV members 
were entirely abstinent from alcohol and other drugs. A few of the controls for the adult study did regularly use alcohol, and perhaps that had an in influence. So, you know, one thing we could learn from these preliminary studies is the need, perhaps, to for for stronger efforts for uh, better control populations. Uh, the the kids on the control group for this study, I believe, they they as you can see, they were from a higher socioeconomic level. They were from a, a, what I was told was a very good private school that they had to, parents had to pay for them to enter. So these were kids from well-off families with good educations. Um, so there was certainly no, no effort to find controls who had a, a lower level of function. Um, well, there's some preliminary indication here as well that perhaps ayahuasca and the support of the community might help uh, kids uh, resist the temptation or influence to experiment with drugs, as is often the case. Uh, one of our Brazilian collaborators from within the UDV, Glaucus de Souza Brito, who's organized much of this, was on a uh, BBC documentary in 97, uh, also called Psychedelic Science. And there he was quoted as saying, in his opinion, uh, ayahuasca served as a vaccine for young people to uh, resist uh, drug abuse. And um, interesting concept, but certainly uh, in need of more uh, rigorous examination. Um, so uh, another interesting yeah, phenomena was um, the, gr the greater degree of uh, attentional problems uh, with, with the control population, be very interested to test that. That also reflects a question that was asked earlier about young people and ADD. Um, yeah, and finally, the, um, certainly in regards to the uh, l l lower degree of drug use and abuse among the UDV members, perhaps ayahuasca is having a role, or perhaps it's the, the, the supportive structure of the, of the religion, the structure of the religion, the support of community that has an impact. Um, I remember back in the early 90s when we were conducting the um, adult study, uh, uh, myself and Dennis McKenna and J.C. Calloway were uh, invited to uh, you know, attend a, uh, a ceremony, which, which, which we did. Um, uh, and uh, af after the ceremony, I, uh, I looked around and I could see multi-generational families, y you know, uh, gathering together. And it was a very harmonious setting, uh, you know, just very good cheer and people comparing what were, seemed to be consistently positive experiences. And so I, I I'm looking at this harmonious setting, multi-generation families, and I and I um, pointed this out to Dennis, who uh, who replied, um, "That's right, Charlie. This this is just like the Mormon Church, only on psychedelics." <laughs> so um, well, that may be significant. Um, you know, my colleague, my late colleague, Marlene de Rios, sadly passed away a few months ago. She and I wrote extensively on the degree to which uh, hallucinogens uh, often have hyper-suggestible effects. So, you know, this, there's a downside to that if you're getting negative messages, but the upside could be if you're at a religious ceremony, and the UDV often provides what they call moral instruction, or just, you know, how, how do you conduct yourself in day-to-day -day life? If they c hear messages about the value of behaving responsibly in society, of, 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 of respecting parents, treating your children well, functioning responsibly uh, at, at work, and you're in a hyper-suggestible state, that may have a lasting uh, impact uh, of a very positive nature. So I think, I think the work we did with the adults and then later with the adolescents is very important, but again, keeping in mind this, these were pre preliminary investigations and we, look, we can be instructed from them how to construct, I think, a better protocols in the future, and, and I do hope we have that opportunity at some point, or other groups will have that opportunity to continue what I believe is very important work. So thank you. Thank you, Bia. Yeah, before we, we open up to questions, I, I just realized that I think this would be a very m important moment that we take one minute of silence in the, mor in the memory of uh, Marlene in the Hills, who is um, was a very pioneering person and 
did uh, studies in the beginning of the 70s, uh, and I, I think uh, it was a great loss for, for the ayahuasca community. So I just, I just uh, want to, to ask one minute of silence in her memory. Thank you, everybody, for that. And uh, we're going to have a round of questions. Uh, it's 12.09. We're going to go until 12.30. Uh, then we're going to go for a, a uh, brunch, uh, lunch break. Uh, and uh, so if you want to come up and, and make your questions, we're going to take a few round of questions. Let me try to answer some of the questions. Uh, the first one about the legal status of ayahuasca. Well, we had a board and the and the government of Brazil that uh, decided after the discussion about uh, a lot of members of UDV, um, Santo Daime, many churches that use ayahuasca together with some experts. Uh, and it has been decided that um, it was approved the, the use of ayahuasca in Brazil within a religious context. If it is used outside religious context um, for recreational use, for instance, it is not allowed. Huh? Uh, but people don't pay m m much attention on it in general. Um, I would like to, to ask you to tell them that you were part of this member uh, groups of discussion, that you were inside the government for discussions. Why don't you tell a little bit of your experience mm. doing that? Yes, it's a, well, th that's a long story, but uh, in uh, I was the, the, the person that was called by the Brazilian government to coordinate this group um, that would decide if ayahuasca should or not be used in Brazil. Um, and it was very difficult to match the, the ideas and the interests of religious people, of scientists, of anthropologists and, and researchers. It was very, very difficult task we had. Uh, but finally we have a document that um, was the, 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 the rationale for um, authorizing the, the religious use of, of ayahuasca in Brazil, and also in this document we, we stress the importance of um, authorizing also uh, research on ayahuasca so that we could, could go deeper in the knowing what the mo more aspects of the ayahuasca use, not just the religious. There is a part of investigation also that was um, that was uh, focused by this document. Um, concerning the use of alcohol, uh, I don't know here in America, but in Brazil there is a tendency, a trend um, in the ayahuasca using churches uh, to, to th th they recommend that the people should not uh, use alcohol. It's not a specifically a prohibition, but is a recommendation, a strong recommendation. And we know that most people uh, try to avoid the alcohol use. Uh, interestingly, we have uh, noticed that many use um, cannabis, uh, uh, so even someone <laughs> use co cocaine, uh, but uh, uh, alcohol is a, a major concern for the, the, the churches. Uh, concerning the question of exposure to ayahuasca, uh, we, when we selected this, uh, the lessons, we, the requirement, the inclusion criteria was that they should have used ayahuasca at least 24 times in the previous two years, so that we could have some kind of um, religious integration within this ayahuasca churches. Um, I ha we have collected all the, 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 the characteristics of this, the, the frequency of use, um, uh, how long they were using. Some, the, some of them were using since uh, they were in their mother's bellies. <laughs> Other were recent users. Uh, but this was the inclusion cr criteria. Uh, we tried to do some research trying to, to identify if the longer they used uh, could affect any of these this things we have assessed. And we couldn't find anything specific uh, in, in the sample. But it, it's a most s sample. 
as Charlie mentioned, is a preliminary study. We have much more study to be done, uh, but we don't have more, much more information about this. In terms of c categories of social class, we know in Brazil it's very, it's a very important issue. In Brazil, we have uh, enormous difference in social status, ec so, uh, economic status of the population. We have very, very poor people together with very, very rich people. <coughs> and in most studies, we try to address this issue of social economic condition. Uh, we use the index that is more acceptable in Brazil, uh, that matches many, many information, the year income, uh, where do you live, uh, educational background, and so you get a lot of information that result in an index, and then y you classify it in class, social class, A, B, C, and D. You know? I can show you, if, if you want more information about this kind of classification, I can send you. Um, in terms of amphetamine use and uh, prescribed Ritalin for the kids, um, um, in this, uh, this description, description of amphetamine use, uh, we only considered non-medical use. So it's the recre recreational use of amphetamine, uh, not considering for, for instance, uh, Ritalin prescription. Um, in this case, we have we have uh, this kind of information too, and no one were under prescribed uh, amphetamine in, in the sample. This, this is not a confounder in the case. And the last question uh, is a good suggestion to see what happened with this adolescence. I, I was talking to Evelyn another another day, and she had the same idea. Uh, we have uh, almost 10 years of this research. These adolescents are now adults. And see, we, were, we, we thought it would be very interesting to know what happened to them 10 years after. Uh, at the time, they, they appeared to be very bright, very intelligent, very interesting people. Um, uh, and, uh, and it would be a nice idea to, to know what, what has happened, no? I just want to, to use this uh, extra minutes and opportunity to ask uh, if there is anybody in the audience who has particular experience uh, in having taken ayahuasca while pregnant. The parent of children that ch take ayahuasca, if you would like to share some information on this topic of ayahuasca for infants and for pregnant women, does anybody have a contribution to give? Ah, just found something new too. <laughs> Apparently there's a guy named Stevens from Brazil that also knows doing some research about this topic. Maybe you can talk about after Toffoli. Very briefly, my wife um, took ayahuasca while she was pregnant um, of our second child. Uh, what I can tell you is that um, apparently pregnancy has its own psychoactive effects by itself. So, <laughs> so she took very, uh, very uh, she perceived that she really had to, to take a, a very small amount of ayahuasca to feel a. Uh, uh, to feel a, a very strong experience. So, and this is the regular um, a procedure in within UDV to lower the doses for pregnant women. More or less half of the doses that per the person was, was used to. I don't know how it goes for the daimi, I don't know how it is in the other traditions, but that our, our, our child is perfect, no problem. <laughs> and uh, of course, and uh, um, in these cases, uh, children start to, to take ayahuasca when they're, they're older, so she never really have any opportunity to take. Uh, and normally, child take very small amounts anyway. So um, uh, this is very important. People have to know that um, there's not like giving ayahuasca to children to have very strong experience. That's not like that. So I wanted to point this. 
Uh, people have sense. I want to <laughs> make you know this. Uh, uh, we're not very clear about the risks, of course, but people have sense. They're not stupid. Okay, thank you, Bia. So I am from Brazil. I am from Rio de Janeiro, and uh, I am a stem cell biologist. So I work with uh, neurodevelopment. So I use the stem cells to try to understand how the brain is formed. And uh, f last year, I started to test the effects of ayahuasca in during brain development using stem cells as uh, some kind of uh, model to study it. So Vanya Dax, who is in the back there, she's the PhD student, and her thesis is try to understand how ayahuasca affects uh, some aspects of development, including, for example, proliferation of neurons, uh, cell death, uh, expression of different factors, and so far we haven't seen any uh, difference in terms of cell death which means that like ayahuasca does not kill neurons during development. So this is the, the one of the data that we have. We didn't, haven't seen any change in the levels of proliferation, but we have to increase the, the, the time to see it better because one idea is that uh, this proliferation can be uh, named as neurogenesis and neurogenesis is also associated with uh, depression. I mean, when the, uh, neurogenesis is a, a good, uh, evidence that the depression is is low so but we haven't seen any difference but we have to increase the, the sample but the only thing that I, I can tell you is that uh, cell death is not an issue when you think about ayahuasca for neurons during development at least oh yeah uh, I, but uh, Vanya had the poster here but uh, she, we have yeah if you want anyone would like to talk to Vanya, have the post and have a very interesting uh, images too that nobody had done before in which we are able to move to, to make a movie of live neurons when they have access to ayahuasca so we can see for example the level of, of a calcium influx into each, or each one of the neurons so they become blue that's the, the color that we use it to label the cells and then when they have the ayahuasca they change to green that's based on the influx of calcium so they are just trying to describe the signaling pathway that's involved in the when the ayahuasca is in contact with uh, human neurons the test, okay, oh, the kind of uh, research that we do, we basically, we get skin samples for each person, and then we can transform that skin cells into neurons. That, that gave the Nobel Prize to Shinya Manaka last year, that kind of technique. So we applying this technique to, to develop these neurons for, that could be from anyone of here without, in, without in having to get the brain of anyone. Just you have the skin, a very small, small sample. We transform it in uh, human neurons that they, are, they have the same background as you, for example. If you get the skin of you, the same genome of the cells that are going to be the neurons are very similar to the, brain, to the cells on your brain. So the idea is that to uh, try to understand the biochemistry and the, gene the genetic behind, the, uh, that w behind the cells being challenged with ayahuasca. So this is the kind of model that we have. And we also have a, a new kind of setup of uh, machines and robots where we can do like 300 uh, 84 samples per hour. So we can test different conditions, different uh, concentrations of ayahuasca and other psychedelic substances in a very fast, in very fast way. We're just starting. Okay. okay. I just want to, to add my personal perspective on this, uh, this article that I published in the Journal of Psychoactive Drugs. I interviewed some uh, medical professionals, some bio-pharmacological, uh, and basically what I showed is that uh, it's the, the, what I call the, the, the logic of the half glass empty or the half glass full. Uh, so basically some doctors will say, well, there's not enough data, and with that they want to imply it's risky, we shouldn't do it. And some other doctors say there's not enough data, therefore we cannot say people can't do it. So I think this is a kind of fundamental uh, dichotomy that exists that has to do with this concept of risk that is central in drug debate, which Toffoli addressed uh, in his talk, which is how do we deal with potential risks, considering that I guess almost all uh, <laughs> Pleasant activities in life involve risks, such as sex, eating, traveling, sports, or whatever. So sh what is the best way to deal with risks, to have like very 
protected sexual life is to have no sex because then you can you don't get any rape or uh, <laughs> and undesired pregnancy or some sexually tra traumatic uh, sexually uh, transmitted disease or maybe some sexual trauma <laughs> experience too just by having sex uh, so not having sex is the most safe way of not having any sexual related problems but is this desirable uh, so I think we have to make the same question about drug use mm -hmm. having zero risk is actually very desirable but it's is is this the best policy that we can come up with and my general argument on on the matter was considering there is not enough data uh, and considering that this is part of a religious uh, central part of certain religious practices uh, that Imagine if you are a father and you belong to a religion that you cannot ch take your children to. That is very complicated. It's like asking a parent that is Catholic not to take his children to catechism or to mass. It's considered central in both Daimi and UDV to raise your children under these religious principles. Uh, it's considered important to transmit the doctrine and the teachings. And ayahuasca is some sort of... Uh, considered a privileged means, not only to children, but to adults. So it's part of their rights. Therefore, it's with the burden resides in the government to prove there is some very problematic aspect. So the burden is not on the groups to have to self-prove that what they do is okay. The burden resides on the government. Nevertheless, I want to point out that we cannot take for granted these issues. And there's also a kind of interesting anthropological a contradiction that I didn't mention on purpose on my article. We anthropologists are more comfortable in assuming that we construct our texts <laughs> according to our perspectives and not just to objective data. Uh, so I did not mention that in a lot of traditions, um, ayahuasca used by pregnant women is considered a high uh, taboo, completely forbidden. No? And uh, when uh, Francisco Montes, it's too bad he's not here anymore. He mentioned he that for for he he said in his little presentation that he they they say it's okay that you drink it until four months. So I think Toffoli mentioned this uh, in his presentation, but he just said four months, not the whole pregnancy. So there's lots of variation. There's no cross uh, you know cultural study showing how different. Uh, settings consider ayahuasca used to be uh, interesting or not. And this is one of those things where biomedicine clashes with ethnographic data. For example, also regarding eating disorders, I have just uh, recently, Brian, Celine and I have done an interview with Taita Juan, and he mentioned that one of the good things, we asked him specifically, how does, uh, is ayahuasca good for kill, uh, kids? Taita Juan is from the Putumayo, he's a uh, Camseta, uh, very traditional uh, Yajesero group from Colombia. And he said that ayahuasca is, consider is considered especially good for uh, children because it helps them learn. And then we're trying to see, you know, should they do it before going to, s to a test or when they are in high school or uh, university? And one of the things he mentioned that it was good for learning. And the other thing he said, that it was good to give to children because children are kind of picky on what they want to eat. They don't want to eat a lot of things. So it helps open their appetite. So I think that was nice if you consider, you know, this uh, aneroxy uh, bulimic thing that came up here. Uh, <laughs> there's lots of perspectives and I think very little dialogue on anthropology and, and bio medicine and we lose a lot by by this lack of dialogues and I feel this this is a true forum of dialogue in this sense and uh, I'm really excited to see this live uh, dialogue because it's very rare to get MD doctors and shamans and practitioners in the room and talk and so I think it's really good and I'm really happy that that you came and I also he's very discreet as you can see very modest he didn't mention very much his central role in leading this group, but <laughs> can you imagine putting all the Daimi and UDV people together and all those branches 
Like there's a saying in Brazil that the worst enemies of the ayahuasquitos are the ayahuasquitos themselves. <laughs> it's not like they say, I'd rather deal with the DEA than, you know, or our DEA than the other group. So that you, in his discreet style, uh, led this group, this communication, also with uh, uh, military <laughs> representatives of the government and other uh, sort of uh, not so, you know, progressive uh, government representatives together with anthropologists and uh, um, all these religious people and that was a very intense and cr creative process that led to a very pioneering legislation which is actually a kind of ad hoc solution to negotiating drug conventions, international drug conventions, because Brazil found a way within the treaties to permit a certain kind of use and it built its own parameters, uh, its own set of rules based on a negotiation of civil society meeting both scientific interests and religious interests and government interests. So I think this model is, was successful, it can be criticized, there's limitations, there are paradoxes, for example, this idea that you can just have religious setting but not therapeutic setting, which was also interest, came in our track, Jeffrey Brofman from the UDV pointed out how much the UDV is not comfortable with therapeutic uses of ayahuasca and it's okay for religious use but not therapeutic uses. So there's many things that could be said and many questions that could be raised but it's definitely a pioneering legislation that has been exported and influenced regulations in diverse countries including here in the US because it's only because it's regulated in Brazil that it was authorized for the UDV and for Santo Daime in Oregon. Same thing for Spain, same thing for Holland, and uh, behind those things, I'm not trying to make any mystification of Darchu or my great colleague, Edward McRae, who is also another, you know, kind of idol of mine that has done a lot of important role, but because of people like this that we, we are having this legislation, so I wanna close with that and uh, call everybody to be back here in one hour at 1.30. Thank you very much. <laughs>